Alright, today is Thursday, the 19th of January, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight, and let's start by this. In the fight between the Fed and the market, the assumption should be that the Fed is the heavyweight and the favorite to win, because there is a rule in the market that says, don't fight the Fed. Those who fought the Fed in the last, let's say, 10 years plus, when the Fed was easing, lost a lot of money. And in the year 2022, those who fought the Fed when the Fed was tightening lost billions of dollars, if not trillions. So the question becomes, why does the market continues to fight the Fed at this point? Because so far, year to date, until let's say yesterday, the market was winning against the Fed. The market made a comeback, fighting against the Fed, and it appeared that the market is winning. Until, of course, yesterday when the market went down big time. But the question is, did the Fed make a comeback? Did the Fed fight back and win? Or was there something exogenous that ended up forcing the market to retreat? Think about this as the WWE. You got the Fed, you got the market fighting each other in the ring. The Fed was winning, then the market made a comeback, choking the Fed, holding it. The Fed appears to be tapping out. Jerome Powell got the thing. And then somebody interferes from out of the ring with the steel chair and starts slamming heads. Both the markets and the Feds. And that new wrestler who just got in the ring with the steel chair, smashing heads, is, um, shall we say, the recession reality. And that recession reality came from retail earnings, when the market and the Fed were shocked by how bad the consumer is doing. Both of them are down in the ring right now, and the referee is counting. And the question now becomes, who's going to get up first? Because the thing about the market is, it is united. All forces in the market are united. They're fighting the Fed. They're assuming that the Fed is bluffing. The data is coming out weak. Inflation is going down. The Fed will have to give up and pivot. The Fed, on the other hand, is not united. The reason why the market continues to fight the Fed is the fact that the Fed suffers from lack of credibility. And this lack of credibility stems from Fed officials speaking with both sides of the mouth. Of course, we got the hawks versus the doves, and the doves, of course, just put the hawk suit on. They're playing an act, but in reality, they've always been doves, even now. And therefore, we continue to hear and listen to these conflicting messages from the Fed. The other thing is, the Fed wants their cake and eat it too. They don't want a revival of inflation. In other words, they want to keep the dollar propped up because if the dollar goes down, inflation will come back. So they have to talk tough. At the same time, they don't want to see panic in the economy. They don't want to see panic in the equities market, for example. A massive crash that causes destabilization and deterioration of the economy rapidly. And you can hear it from these statements that we heard so far from Fed officials, the zombies that we hear from every single day. We heard from James Bullard of the San Luis Fed yesterday, for example. And he is sticking to his guns that the Fed funds rate should be north of 5% and that the Fed should be front-loading more rate hikes right now, of course, while the economy can absorb them. And I do agree with Mr. Bullard, but he also spoke with both sides of the mouth. He said that the probabilities of a soft landing increased markedly. So which one is it here, Bullard? You're going to play this game and confuse the market? Don't be surprised by the market's ability to continue to fight the Fed. Because you guys are all over the place. Take, for example, today we heard from the vice chair, Madam Braindead. And of course, if it was up to her, she'll be printing right now on steroids because she believes in MMT. She's a radical. And when you hear all these statements from Madam Braindead, it kind of forces you to appreciate Jerome Powell out of all people. But anyways, this is one side of the mouth. This is the dovish side. The vice chair said today that the recent decline in inflation was an important development that could raise the question over the extent to which the central bank needs to cool off the labor market to bring inflation down. In other words, Mrs. Braindead is saying maybe we shouldn't see higher unemployment in the economy to get the job done in defeating inflation. Maybe we have done enough already. And here comes the other side of the mouth, the hawkish side. The vice chair says interest rate policy will have to be restrictive for some time, quote unquote, even with the recent moderation of inflation. So which one is it here? You're talking with both sides of the mouth, you're confusing everybody, and you wonder why the market continues to fight the Fed? And here is from New York Fed President Williams, who was formerly known as the King of the Doves, and my hunch is he is still a dove. He's just playing this act of being a hawk right now. And President Williams said today, he won't prejudge the size of rate rise at the upcoming meeting. In other words, if it is 50, he'll be okay with it. 
If it is 25, he'll be okay with it too. He also added that the Fed has a ways to go on rate rises. So Williams appears to be in the hawkish side right now. Here comes the dove. The new Boston Fed president who replaced uh, President Rosenberg, the insider trader who resigned in shame, of course, using his kidney as an excuse. But anyways, the new Boston Fed president, Suzanne Collins, says that measured approach to rate rises makes sense. In other words, she's now supporting 25 basis points in the next meeting, not 50. And here is uh, Nick Timoros from the Wall Street Journal summarizing all of this. He says Fed officials split over rate rise pace. Bullard says, why not get it to the level that you want to be at 5%? Why stall? Question mark. And by the way, I do agree with Bullard here. And then we have the um, Dallas Fed President Logan, and she says, I do not find it particularly helpful to lock in on a peak rate. In other words, she's disagreeing with Bullard. And then we got the Philly Fed President Harker, who also spoke with a hawkish side and a dovish side. Today, he spoke with a dovish tone. He said, we're starting to see things work. Let this work. What does that mean, Harker? Add more tightening, get the job done now, or ease and watch whatever is going on right now to continue or not. This kind of uncertainty, this kind of indecision by the Fed is causing the market to fight the Fed continuously. And as the market continues to fight the Fed, one of these two have to buckle. Is it going to be the Fed? If they do, equities will rally big time, but we will see a revival of inflation later on and the economy will pay a dire price for this stupid decision. If the Fed ends up winning, it's also going to come at a price and it's going to be a steep one because the equities market will plummet big time. And the longer this fight goes on, the more damage will happen to the economy. But you know what? This is not the only fight we should be concerned about. There is another fight going on in DC right now that is about to heat up big time, and it could be front and center in rattling the market like you have never seen before. So let's talk about it, and here it is, in Focus Tonight. Extraordinary measures. This is what the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said today. And of course, the Secretary is referring to the debt ceiling that the United States of America has reached today, meaning no more adding to the debt. We hit a ceiling. And until Congress raises that ceiling, the United States of America could be on the brink of default. Now let's take it one step at a time, because Janet Yellen is one of the biggest hypocrites in the world right now. Not to mention the fact that she was wrong about transitory inflation. So the fact that such an uh, incompetent fool remains at the head of the Treasury of the United States is absolutely stunning to me. For example, back in 2017, Janet Yellen said that the $20 trillion national debt should keep people awake at night. She was concerned about the national debt back then. And now that the national debt has ballooned to north of $31 trillion, Janet Yellen sees no problem at all with this kind of debt. She wants Congress to raise the debt ceiling and rack in more and more and more debt. And it is really baffling. Can you imagine if you have $10,000 credit card debt and they tell you that should keep you up at night? You should pay this debt down. And now that your debt moved higher to $20,000, that's okay all of a sudden. That's better than $10,000. Does that make sense to anybody? But now that we've hit the ceiling, today the secretary announced taking extraordinary measures to keep the country afloat, to avert the first ever default of the United States of America. Now, what does that mean? Extraordinary measures. What does that mean? It means a bunch of accounting gimmicks to kick the can down the road. That's all what it means. But here's a little setup for you on why this is going to be problematic. Take a look. In Washington, a dangerous standoff is looming. Later today, the Treasury Department is expected to announce it's taking extraordinary measures to prevent America from defaulting on its debt. Those include shifting money between government accounts. The Treasury will also temporarily hold off payments to some federal employee retirement plans and health funds for retired postal workers to give Congress a few more months to raise the debt ceiling. Republicans who control the U.S. House, and particularly those who demanded concessions from Kevin McCarthy before he became Speaker, say they want promises Washington will cut its expenses before raising the debt limit. Why wouldn't we sit down now, set a budget, set a path to get us to a balanced budget, and let's start paying this debt off? But the White House says it won't negotiate over such a vital thing. 
This is something that should be happening without conditions. Virginia Democrat Abigail Spamberger says just the possibility of brinksmanship could rattle the markets, 401ks, and trigger a recession. Now, I know some of you recall back in 2011 when we got to the same situation back under the Obama administration when they were fighting Republicans, especially the uh, Green Tea Party or whatever, and the government did shut down. The stock market went down by double digits, and it was not fun back then. A lot of volatility, a lot of uncertainty, and a lot of losses in the stock market. Of course, it opens the opportunity to bet against the market and short it. The question becomes, are we going to get to this point this time around? My hunch is, yes, and then some. Forget about whether we're going to default or not. I don't think that's going to happen. I think at the end of the day, of course, obviously, they will end up raising the debt ceiling. But it's not going to happen without a major, major fight, which could be consequential to the economy and the stock market. And this time, it is different. We have heard this movie before multiple times. They fight a little bit, it's a little bit of drama, and then they get together and they raise the debt ceiling again. I think this time, it's going to be different because we have one catch that is really important. We'll talk about that in a second, but... Just to give you a little bit of picture here, Stephen Moore says that America will hit the $31 trillion debt ceiling today. We already hit it, it's done. That is 120% of our GDP and 246876 bucks per taxpayer. Now, the majority of Americans make a lot less than this number. The average income is what, $50,000, $60,000? How can anyone believe that this is sustainable? You can continue to kick the can down the road and raise the debt ceiling year after year, but at some point, it's going to bite. And we're getting closer and closer and closer to that point. And your question is, why Maverick? What's different about this fight this time around? How about interest rates moving higher? Take a look. Yeah, Melissa, there are really two factors here that are speeding up the debt limit fight in Washington. One is short term and one has long term implications. The first is the Biden administration's pause on student loan payments. The White House keeps extending this program at an estimated cost of five billion dollars a month. It's now set to end in August for a total price tag of one hundred and ninety five billion dollars. And that could make a difference as we get down to the deadline. And the other issue is interest rates and the cost of paying down our debt. Last spring, the CBO projected that interest payments would be about $400 billion in fiscal 2022. The reality is the total was $475 billion, more than we spend on veterans benefits, transportation or higher education. The reason, of course, is because the Fed hiked rates more aggressively than anticipated. Melissa, the amount we spend on interest payments is on track to blow past the record of 3.2 percent of GDP by the end of this decade, if not sooner. Back wow. over to you. Now, this is absolute insanity. The government paid $475 billion in interest alone. Once again, folks, $475 billion. This is more than the GDP, the entire GDP of developed countries. We paid that in interest alone because interest rates continue to rise higher. And the expectations are rates are going to continue to move higher because inflation hasn't been solved, despite what the propagandists say. For example, today, the boss of J.P. Morgan Morgan, the laundromat, Jamie Demon said that rates will rise above 5% because there is still a lot of underlying inflation. And he is absolutely right. The rate could go to 5%, even 6%, if not north of 6% when this fight is said and done. We have $30 trillion in debt. Plus, if last year we paid $475 billion in interest rate alone, are we going to get to the point of paying $700 billion in servicing debt alone? How about a trillion? This is unsustainable, folks. This is the collapse of the Roman Empire. And on top of that, the boss of the laundromat says we should never question the creditworthiness of the United States government. That is just a part of the financial structure of the world. This is not something you should be playing games with at all. And I say, what's up with the game? Gaslighting. The government created this problem by spending on steroids, abusing taxpayer money. They created this problem. We're now in a $31 trillion plus hole. And now the government is blackmailing everybody, saying, hey, if you don't raise the debt limit, we're going to have disastrous consequences in the economy and the entire country might default on its debt. So you better shut up, let your criticism about the spending on steroid hold for a while, and you got to get along and raise the debt ceiling right now. Otherwise, God forbid, the entire ship might sink. And I say forget about that. We're not going to put the fire down that you just started. We'll put it down under the condition that you should be restrained and restricted from moving in this ship until we dock. Because you keep lighting it on fire over and over and over again. And you continue to blackmail us with the same 
shit over and over and over again. And therefore, I replied to this uh, regime propagandist today. He says the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen just sent a letter to Kevin McCarthy saying she has begun taking extraordinary measures. If Republicans truly cared about the economy, they would take action to raise the debt ceiling. But they do not care. All of us hurt as a result. And I say Republicans should not agree to raise the debt ceiling without guarantees of curbing down the insane spending on steroids. Of taxpayer money, a tool. And the fight is already starting. For example, Senator Paul says, Our national debt has gone up $4 trillion in just two years. And now stands at a record-breaking $31 trillion. Democrats want a clean bill to raise the debt ceiling with no conditions. Republicans must say no. The problem is if Republicans say no, the country is going to default. So now we have to talk about the conditions to raise the debt ceiling. And the risk to the market and the economy comes from this fight about the conditions to agree and raise the debt ceiling. And before you think that the Republicans are the good guys, they're also hypocrites. Because part of the insane spending on steroids is defense spending, which the Republicans have no problem with at all. Over $850 billion, more than the entire amount of money that the country spends domestically on schools, hospitals, Medicare, Social Security. We're spending over $800 billion to sustain the empire, to keep troops in Korea, Japan, Europe, Kuwait, we all know that the majority of that money actually goes in money laundering because despite 600 billion, 700 billion, 800 billion, a trillion dollars in defense budget, the Pentagon comes out bitching and moaning about how depleted our military is and how the Chinese are about to steal our lunch. Buddy, what happened to the money? 800 billion dollars? That is twice or maybe three times what the Chinese spend on their own military? Where did the money go? But of course, the Republicans have no problem with that at all. And even if they do have a problem with it, they're not going to come out and say it because we have blackmailed politicians and put them under threat. But if you say anything against defense spending, what are you, Russian bro? You hate America? You don't like defense spending? You don't want to keep us safe? What are you, Chinese or something? So nobody wants to talk about this. Nobody wants to tackle the elephant in the room, the insane spending on defense, quote unquote. Anyhow, Peter Schiff says that the U.S. Treasury Secretary had admitted that the only way to avoid a default on the national debt is to raise the debt ceiling so the government, listen to this, can borrow from new lenders to repay existing lenders. This amounts to an official admission that the U.S. is running the world's largest Ponzi scheme. And I say, Amen. There is no other way to look at it. This is the biggest Ponzi scheme in the history of mankind. And who's going to pay the price? The new generation of Americans. Now, when I say that this time is different, it is due to two things. We talked about one, interest rates moving higher. But the second thing, and perhaps the most important one, that will cause insane amount of volatility in the equities market if it takes place, is the fact that the House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has no balls left. His balls is being held hostage. He came out on TV today and was sweating bullets. And this is what he said. So what I really think we would do is treat this like we would treat our own household. If you had a child, you gave them a credit card, and they kept hitting the limit, you wouldn't just keep increasing it. You'd first see, what are you spending your money on? How can we cut items out? Every government has to do this. Every state has to balance their budget, county, city. For the White House to say they won't even look at it, that they can't find one penny out of a dollar of eliminating waste, I think they're just trying to put us into bankruptcy. What I am saying, and it's my conversation with the president on our first conversation, let's sit down together. Let's look at the places that we can change our behavior. Now, remember all the fight about McCarthy being the Speaker of the House, and he gets rejected over and over and over and over again until he finally won? And he only won by making concessions. And one of these concessions will come at play in this fight, and it could cause massive volatility, folks. The final tally was 216 for Mr. McCarthy and 212 for the Representative Jeffries of New York. This is the Democrat with, listen to this, six old Republicans voting present. Now, what is the problem with this? Here it is. Mr. McCarthy agreed to allow a single lawmaker to force a snap vote at any time to oust the Speaker, a rule that he had previously refused to accept, but now he accepted it. In other words, let's say one of the six, we only need one. One of them says, you know what? No deal. Let the country default. We need to learn a lesson here. 
I'm not going to vote for raising the debt ceiling, even with the conditions, assuming the Republicans secure some. I'm not going to vote for that. And if you, Mr. McCarthy, if you go ahead and agree with the Democrats and you raise the debt ceiling, I'm going to vote to oust your ass. This is why this time it's going to be different. And the reason is McCarthy's balls will be nailed to the wall if he just agrees to raise the debt ceiling with no conditions. The process to come up with these conditions will be messy. That's number one. Number two, what if we have holdouts? What if we have a single, just one, a single representative who wants to see the country go into default because that's what their constituents are saying? Perhaps the country needs to learn a lesson on fiscal responsibility. And maybe a default is the only plausible way for that lesson to be learned. Now listen to this guy. I don't know what, who this guy is to begin with, but I know he is in the House. His vote could take McCarthy down. He tweeted today, We cannot raise the debt ceiling. Democrats have carelessly spent our taxpayer money and devalued our currency. They've made their bed, so they must lie in it. Let's say this guy's not bluffing, and he says no to raising the debt ceiling. Otherwise, I'm taking McCarthy down. That dynamic alone will cause insane market volatility. I'm telling you right now. And the fact that the market is not even caring about this, the fact that the VIX remains at around 20, that doesn't make sense at all. And I think this fight is going to heat up big time from today all the way till the summer, where is the deadline. And between now and then, we could see an insane amount of volatility. So the message is, I'm not being dramatic here. I'm just telling you. We've seen it back in 2011. The stock market went down double digits. We could see it again. So buckle up. That is the message of the day. And with that, folks, let's move on to cover the stock market information. And we begin with the closing of the indices. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average down by 252.40 points or a decline of 0.76%. The Nasdaq in the red by 104.74 points or a decline of 0.96%. The S&P also down by 30.01 points or a decline of 0.76%. On to the sector's performance today. At number one, capturing the gold medal. Here it is. Energy. Back in top, baby. At a number two for the silver, communication services, aka Google and Meta. At the number three for the bronze, healthcare. The rest in the red, led by industrials technology, and cyclicals. Notice that the leaders year-to-date are the laggards today, and now we're seeing a comeback of healthcare at least, but energy is taking the lead as we predicted in this channel. Anyways, the breadth NYSE 33% advancing versus 65% declining. The Nasdaq 32% advancing versus 65% declining. My hunch is we see a rebound at least in the morning, and then you gotta remember, you fade the rip. We could see a gap and crap in the morning. We can see a rally that fades away by the end. So keep that in mind. When it comes to commodities, the dollar was down slightly for the day. Now, overnight, we've seen some volatility. It wasn't extreme at all in the New Zealand Kiwi. And that kind of moved the dollar up and down a little bit. Of course, the PM in that country resigned. Kind of suspicious. But anyways, it was not a major move at all. So we're seeing a mixed picture here. The majority of commodities are in the red, but the exception is energy. We talked about the comeback of energy, but specifically oil. The WTI closed the day with gains of almost one and a quarter percent. Brent closed the day with gains north of one and a half percent. Gasoline Arbob closing the day north of three and a quarter percent worth of gains. You're going to start to pay more at the pump now. Heating oil, similar story. Closing the day with gains north of 3.5%. The laggard remains natural gas, down by almost 3.5%. Folks, at this point, you don't have to be a genius to figure this out. Natural gas is being manipulated. I don't know who it is. JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, the government, the CIA, I don't know. But somebody's manipulating natural gas prices down. And he got to be a child to believe otherwise. When it comes to softs, we have declines led by cocoa futures down by uh, more than 2% and cotton futures down almost 1.5%. And then we have more modest declines under 1% for OJ and sugar futures. On the other hand, we have lumber leading the gains north of half a percentage point for the day, while coffee futures closed pretty much flattish today. When it comes to metals, we have a rebound for gold, silver, palladium, copper. Although platinum was absent from the rally today, gold moved higher, scoring gains north of one and a quarter percent. So the assumption for now, at least according to commodities, the dollar will continue to go down. And the question becomes, what will the Fed do about that? Now, mind you, you combine the lack of credibility by the Fed to this upcoming fight on uh, Capitol Hill, and it's hell, not hell. The dollar could be plummeting big time here, and that's inflationary. Anyhow, meets it down across the board, losses almost of 1% across the board. 
Feeder cattle, live cattle, lead hogs futures all down for the day. It was also a down day across the board for grains, with soybean oil futures leading the declines down about 1.5% today. On to the big casino, the options market, what do we see here? The volume is cooling down slightly, not by a lot. We're seeing some confidence here, moving slightly away from puts toward calls. In other words, we might see a rebound, but the rebound will be short-lived. From this point on, ladies and gentlemen, fade the rip until something changes. For now, we don't have any indicator that something will change. We need to see corporate earnings. We need to get this out of the way. We need to get the Fed out of the way before we find a clear direction for the stock market. But for now, the assumption should be fading the rip. With that being said, Tesla, the souffle, number one, with around 2.5 million contracts traded today, about 51% of those were puts. Apple, number two, with around 1 million contracts traded today, about 53% of the volume was for puts, not calls. Amazon at number 3, with 800,000 contracts traded today, about 55% of those were calls. On to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We begin with the ticker PACB. This is a biotech company called uh, Pacific California, whatever. The name has been rallying impulsively year to date. All the rumors of uh, buyout, new development, it doesn't matter. We see these biotech names spiking significantly higher based on these rumors. But if there is no confirmation, they move down Big. And therefore, my hunch here is somebody is selling these calls, and the bet is the name will go down from this point on. But we have to read it from the buyer's perspective because these kind of trades are initiated, and usually the initiation happens from the buyer's side. And if we do this, then somebody's seeing more gains to come for the name, and they bought the 12 bucks calls for the expiration date, March 17th. With expectations, the name could add more gains, at least worth 6% from this point on, all the way till the expiration date. They paid around 1 buck and 40 cents a piece. Stenner, the trade all in all spending around 1.4 million dollars. And then what about the ticker FIS for Fidelity? and somebody sees the name moving higher. The name is bruised and beaten, down about 40% in a year, but somebody sees a rebound coming and they bought the 75 calls for the expiration date, February 17th, with expectations that the name could move higher and gain more than 5.5% all the way till the expiration date. And they paid around 2 bucks and 25 cents a piece to enter. This trade all in all spending around $900,000. And then what about the ticker SKX for Sketchers, which also happens to be one of my favorite names, and the reason is... I happen to be a proud owner of a very wide pair of feet. And unfortunately, we have only two companies, us uh, with wide feet, only two companies that make shoes for us. Sketchers and uh, the other one is New Balance. I'm liking the name here. I'm liking the chart, the recent move. It's a big move year to date, but somebody sees more gains to come. And I did follow the trade. If it works out, I'm going to own the stock in my portfolio. And the bet is buying the 50 bucks calls for the expiration date, February 17th. With expectations, that the name could move higher and gain more than 9% by then. We paid around 90 cents a piece, Tanner. This trade, all in all, spending around $400,000. And then what about Amazon, AMZN? We got horrific retail sales data yesterday. Amazon so far a winner, a major one, year to date. Was the rally justified given the fact that we have weak retail sales data, even for online stores? And therefore, somebody's fading the rip here, buying the 83 puts for the expiration date, February 10th. And the expectations are that Amazon could move down and lose more than 11.5% of its value by then. They paid around $1.40 a piece, Stenner, this trade all in all, spending around $850,000. And then what about the ticker UCO? This is the Bloomberg ETF for crude oil. So somebody's betting that crude will move higher from this point on. And they bought the 34 calls for the expiration date, March 17th, with expectations that the name could move higher and gain more than 11% by the expiration date. They paid around two bucks and 20 cents a piece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending around $1.3 million. Last but not least, we have a call calendar spread here. My favorite. I love, love calendar spreads. And in this case, they're betting that eBay is going to move higher, but it's going to take a while. It's not going to happen right away. And therefore, they bought the 50 bucks calls for the expiration date, March 17th. Likewise, they sold the 50 bucks calls, same one, only the expiration date for this one is February 17th. So the expectations are eBay will be north of 50 bucks a piece 
by March, but not by the expiration date February 17th. All in all, they paid around one buck a piece for buying the 50 bucks calls with the expiration date March 17th. And they received in credit about 50 cents a piece for selling the 50 bucks calls for the expiration date February 17th. All in all, the entry cost is reduced to 50 cents a piece. That brings the total all the way to about $200,000. On to the heat map analysis. What do we see here? In last night's episode, I said, watch where the rotation is going to happen. Everything went down indiscriminately yesterday. They're going to pick something. What are they picking? Because this is really important. It will tell us where the dip buying, the appetite at least for dip buying resides. Well, today we see healthcare being picked up. We see energy being picked up. We see gold being picked up. We see some of the consumer defensives being picked up. Look at tobacco, for example, got an upgrade. Philip Morris got an upgrade today. Philip Morris happens to be one of uh, our names in the recession theme. We also have Meta and Google being picked up along with the Chinese names, Alibaba, JD, the rest of them. But they did not pick up chips. They did not pick up industrials. They did not pick up the cyclicals, the retail stores, financials. None of those sectors got picked up. What is the message by the market right now? Slowly but surely, the market is realizing that we have a stagflation theme in which the recession theme, the ultra defensives in the big pharma names and the consumer defensives, these tend to outperform under a recession. But we still have the stagflation part. And to play the stagflation part, they also picked up energy. They picked up gold. So the message is now clear. The market is starting to realize that perhaps we're not going to have a soft landing. Instead, we will have a prolonged stagflation that eventually will lead into a recession. Now, let's talk about some corporate news here and the movers of the day. We start with Amazon, a year-to-date winner, but we have signs for trouble. And the earnings of Amazon, boy, it'll be really interesting to see. For one thing, we know that retail is not doing pretty good across the board. We know that the consumer is getting annihilated out there. We know that Amazon is laying off thousands thousands of employees. In other words, Amazon has an expense problem. And instead of cutting the salary, the insane, a perhaps unjustified salary of the CEO Andy Jassy worth $250 million a year, they're laying off employees. And now we got the news that Amazon is shutting down the charitable donation program, Amazon Smile. So when you buy stuff on Amazon, you can choose a favorite charity to donate to uh, for pets or whatever. Amazon says we have... Uh, we have to cut expenses here. So no more charity. But we're not going to cut the pay for the CEO. And then we have news for the souffle Tesla. And a driver who's uh, loyal to the FSD program, in other words, this is an Elon Kulti, his car swerved and he got into an accident. Yet he still believes in the F FSD program and he loves Elon Musk. Elon Musk can't do anything wrong. We have a word for this guy. It starts with a C, ends with a K. Anyways, more souffle news for you. A Tesla owner says... He knows people who tie weights to the steering wheel to trick the system, this is the FSD system, into thinking they're actively driving. And this is why, when you see a souffle in the road, avoid. For one thing, they're possessed. They can accelerate out of nowhere. They can break out of nowhere. And the geniuses driving these souffles are reckless. They sleep behind the steering wheel. They tie weights to it. Remember back in the day when uh, Prius drivers were the annoying ones? Today, it's souffle drivers. Last but not least, we have news from Bank of America. We have the cult of Davos right now. And Bank of America CEO said over there, we, listen to this, this is really important. We overachieved on the hiring side and we went past our target headcount. In other words, if you happen to work for Bank of America, you better start preparing right now. You better start buying some diapers because you're going down. You're going to lose your job. It's just a matter of time here before you hear mass layoffs at Bank of America. So start planning now. Anyhow, moving on to the heat map for the ETFs, what do we see here? The most important thing I'm watching for is everything was in the red in yesterday's map. And I said, watch, what are they going to pick up today? So what happened today? They picked up energy, XLE, XL, XOP, excuse me. They picked up uh, gold, GDX, gold miners, silver. They picked up emerging markets and Chinese market ETFs, FXI, etc. So what is the theme here? Betting against the US dollar. When the dollar goes down, energy goes up, gold goes up, copper goes up, emerging markets go up. You know what else goes up? Chips. When the dollar goes down, chips go up, import, export, dynamic. 
you know the deal. But chips were absent from today's rally. SMH was down, SOXX was down, SOXL down. And therefore, I've been warning, if you want to chase the rally because the dollar is down, avoid doing so by chasing technology. Stick to the commodities cohort, be it oil, be it metals. It's a lot better than technology. Technology has bigger problems. Re-earnings, for example, which is not a problem for energy companies, at least. Anyhow, let's move on and do some charts and then wrap it up. We start with SPY, the S&P 500. 130 minutes chart. We got a gap down, the bear flag continues to play out, and then midday, and I sent a message on Discord about it, we're going to see a reversal, we're going to see a move higher, and perhaps refilling the gap. The SBY did move higher, but it did not close the gap. It got back to the resistance of 391, it couldn't make it, and it closed below this number by the end of the day. Now, is it over? Was it a sign that the SPY is about to go down? Perhaps. But mind you, had the chart closed at the lows of the day, I would have said, okay, we have a rejection, a reversal, and a confirmation. And down we go all the way to 385. But this could be attempt number one at cracking above 391 and closing the gap above. The chart could not make it today. But after hours, the chart got new information. Information coming from earnings, Netflix, for example. That could stem some optimism in the morning, at least. We could see a gap that takes us all the way to 391. 91, maybe all the way to closing the gap, and then we see a gap and crap and a sell off right away. This is what I would be watching for in tomorrow's activities. And here is the daily chart for the continuous contract, the SP 500. We got a confirmation today that 3,960 is a no go. We lost the support. We have a confirmation today. Now, if we do have a reflex reaction, as I anticipate in the morning at least, we could see the SPY's futures moving higher in a retest to 3,960 as resistance, or perhaps it could crack above it. But my hunch is it could be a trap, and down it goes again. So please be careful not to be sucked in in any rally here. You gotta be careful. The confirmation that we have a gap in crap would be if we see a gap above 3,960, then we see a loss of that support right away. And look, on Discord today, Today said I closed my puts with tomorrow's expiration. I still expect a gap fill to form a head and shoulder formation here. In other words, whatever rebound we see in the S&P, that will be a bull trap. And then down we go again. And I gave you this chart. I'm looking at the gap above. The gap was not filled both in the way up and the way down. And immediately we got a rally in the SPY moving higher. It got into the zone of that gap, but couldn't make it. So is that it? Does it go down from this point on? My hunch is it's going to give it another shot. If it does close the gap and then reverse and move down again, that will be your shorting signal that the chart is indeed forming a head and shoulder formation. And then down it goes in a retest to 3800. 3800 doesn't hold. That's another shorting signal because we go down to 3600 from that point on. What about the Qs? 30 minutes chart. What do we see here? Similar dynamic with the SPY. We have a gap down. Then midday, we got a little bit of energy to move higher to close the gap. But there was a little bit of hesitancy at the end there because we have Netflix earnings coming out. A lot of folks were betting against Netflix. A lot of folks were betting that we're going to see a big gap down tomorrow. It was a lot of de-risking by the end. And therefore, I'm not reading too much into the uh, last candle of the day, at least in the 30 minutes here. My expectation is actually for a pop higher in the morning. Now that we have Netflix out of the way, we could see a pop higher to close the gap, and then we crap. This is what I'm looking for here. What about the NASDAQ continuous contract, the daily chart? What do we see? We have a rejection. We have a reversal and a confirmation. But is it going to be easy? Is it just going to go down in a straight line all the way to 11,058 and a half? The answer is not quite. They're going to have to run a retest and a reattempt at least to recapture 11,689 of support. For now, all indicators say that they're going to fail. Absent of the Fed saying something, absent of earnings surprising to the upside, of course. So if you missed shorting two days ago, the chart might give you an opportunity to short again. But you got to watch where the reflex rebound is going to get us. If it reverses right away, if it is a gap and crap, that is your shorting opportunity because we go down all the way to at least 11,058 and a half. IWM, Russell 2000, 30 minutes. What do we see here? Again, we have a gap in the morning. The chart rallies all the way in an attempt to close the gap but it faces resistance step one at 183 and it couldn't make it above this number. But is it over? Do we have a reversal? Do we have a rejection and a reversal? Not quite. We have a rejection for now. We don't have a reversal because the chart did not close at the lows of the day. In other words, the IWM could give it another shot in the morning tomorrow and it could close the gap. The question becomes, is it going to hold the gains by the end of the day or not? My hunch is maybe not. Dixie, what's going on here? Yesterday, based on the hawkish commentary by Bullard, we got a retest to 103. The dollar could not make it. And today it moved down again. So 
we have a confirmation here that the dollar is going to continue to move down absent of the Fed coming out with a clear message that we're going to do 50 in December, uh, excuse me, in February. And we're going to keep the rates as high as we can, higher for longer. And if you want to fight us, come at me, bro. We're going to crush your heads. Absent of the Fed saying that, the dollar will continue to go down. And therefore, we have a rebound in gold, big time. So the bull flag that we talked about in yesterday's video is playing out, and gold is now above the last Fibonacci resistance level. In other words, if this rally continues, we're going to see gold challenging the highs from 2020. Am I chasing it right now? Am I jumping in? The answer is not quite. And I know what you're going to say, sour grapes, Maverick. You missed the move. You're right. You're 100% right. I'm upset about it. But I usually play gold by buying uh, gold miners. And my favorite name, New Mount Gold, did not crack above an important support slash resistance level, which is 53. I need to see a decisive closing over 53. I need to see earnings from New Mount out of the way. And if it's all good, if the dollar continues to go down, then I'll be buying shares of New Mount and adding it back into my long portfolio. What about Brent Oil? What do we see here on the daily chart? So far, so good. Above 85, moving higher, no problems here. Even if it moves down by a little bit we have no problems so long as the chart is making higher lows what about the 10 year what do we see here still waiting and seeing still waiting for further clarity but the message is clear the market continues to go down along with the 10 year going down that is a confirmation of the recession theme now it's a little too early to make that as a conclusion that it's over it's done and this is how the 10 year is going to behave from this point on we have to see how the 10 year is going to behave after the fomc let's say Powell comes out with the hawkish narrative be it raising rates by 50 basis points or even 25 basis points but he says the job is not done we're not going to pause right now we're going to continue to raise rates by 25 basis points increments from this point on and the 10 year goes down either way then you got your confirmation once and for all that from this point on it's going to be the recession theme in which of course the TLT tends to outperform but we need to wait and see how it's going to react once it gets to 109 and a half for now no update whatsoever VIX four hours chart what do we see here it almost got to the resistance at 21.83 and then it pulled back big time but it continues to keep 20 as support now you might see a phenomenon in the morning where the futures pop higher but we see the VIX also moving higher if that is the case that will be your leading indicator that we're gonna see a gap and crap in the SPY then what about Apple 30 minutes what's going on here the bear flag played out but Apple caught support from 134.37 and it moved all the way to 130 35.36 and closed pretty much right around that number i'm not buying it here i think sooner or later apple is going to go down below 134.37 but we might see some consolidation here all the way until earnings so don't bet on a massive move right before earnings it might not happen but the premiums are going to start to rise higher so you better prepare right now in your options trading strategy ahead of apple's earnings tesla hourly chart what's going on here it lost the important support of 128.62 it gave it a shot throughout the day to crack above it again couldn't make it but is it a rejection and a reversal the answer is not of course because we have a rejection we don't have a reversal because if we have a reversal tesla should have closed at the lows of the day so this could be attempt number one then we see attempt number two tomorrow in the morning for example and tesla cracks above 128.62 let's say it moves down after that point then we have support number one after 128.62 122.39 which happens to be a gap fill now if you happen to be bullish tesla you want the chart to consolidate right before earnings which by the way will take place next week that way tesla goes into earnings beaten bruised with negative sentiment and whatever numbers tesla puts out the stock is going to react positively but if it rallies significantly into the number then the risk becomes to the downside tulips bitcoin what's going on here continues to hold on on to support twenty thousand. 593.34 do you buy it now absolutely not it could pull back any minute now you gotta see it moving higher we gotta see this challenge of keeping 20,000 593.34 support ending one way or the other whether bitcoin loses that support and look for support below or succeeds in keeping this support and starts to move higher this battle has to be out of the way first now here are some bonus charts for you. yesterday on discord i said it's time time for what to buy put options on nvidia and my thesis is we have uh, a gap fill that was met with failure this is a daily chart of course the chart closed the gap but couldn't close above the gap which means we could see an a b c pattern 
But before you get too excited about shorting NVIDIA big time and going out of the money, you got to be careful here. You got to be disciplined because I also said this, this is a weekly chart of NVIDIA. We have a reverse head and shoulder formation at hand right now. We have a channel, a sloping downward channel that has been going on all the way since 2022. Recently, the chart cracked above this channel. Now in typical charting behavior, after an important breakout from a significant pattern, we see a retest. So the bet here is for a pullback and a retest. If the retest fails, then you can go more aggressive. But for now, your expectations should be a retest, a pullback, and that's it. And here's the update. This is a weekly chart once again. The video moved down, but not quite at the retest yet. So you might want to wait in the sidelines, see how the retest is going to do. And then if it fails, you might want to hop back in and buy some more puts. Because if we go back to the daily chart for NVIDIA and we see the reverse ABC pattern playing out, this could take us all the way down to fill the gap at 134.21. Now, this is not going to happen in a week or so. Maybe it does. But if you're going to play it via put options, you got to give yourself enough time. And then I shared this chart for HD Home Depot. This is a monthly chart, a long term one. On my forecast is we have a reverse ABC pattern on hand. This is confirmed by the weakness in the RSI and the MACD. And the assumption is if this plays out, we go down all the way to the trend line in HD that has been going on since at least 2015. I also said this yesterday. I said MS, this is Morgan Stanley, is a delicious short. It will close the gap. Their earnings were not that good. And I said, let's play fill the gap. We have three charts here. We have MS, Morgan Stanley, a daily chart. We have UAL, this is for United Airlines, which popped higher after earnings. But my bet was it's going to flush down and close the gap at around 47.71. And the last one for the ticker BURL, this is for Burlington Stores, the coat factory, which should be in the trash, by the way. But the name ran it significantly higher, at least um, since October of last year. And it opened a massive gap. The gap stands at around 157.64. My bet is it's going to go down to close this gap. But it's going to take a long, long time. Now, the trade for United Airlines, UAL, is done. It's complete. It filled the gap. It went below the gap. We're done with it. Morgan Stanley, not quite. So you still have the opportunity here. We could see a refill of the gap above first. And then it moves down to fill the gap below at 91.66. Now, when it comes to BURL, it's not going to be an easy one. It's going to take time. And the reason is the options for this name are not traded widely. So either you're going to short the name by borrowing the shares or... You're going to buy puts, but for the longer term. Maybe you want to pick the expiration date in the summer or beyond. Now, the case against BURL is not just technical in nature. It's also fundamental. We talked about retail sales plummeting. We got the earnings from Nordstrom after hours. That's a disaster and a confirmation that the consumer is getting weaker. So all in all, I'm becoming bearish on retail stores. But there is one store that I would consider actually buying. And I will share this name in my portfolio review video, which is coming out this weekend. Apologies for the delay. And the last chart I got for you is a final call that I did today on Discord. Lotto ticket. This is not a serious trade by any means. This is a lotto ticket, as I said. Buying puts in the S triple Qs, the 47 puts with the expiration date of tomorrow. Why? Because I'm betting on a rebound in the Qs, the Dow, the SPY. It could be a gap and crap. So if that is the case and we see the Qs moving higher and the S triple Qs moving down in the morning, in a gap down in this case, you close the trade right away. You're not taking any chances here. When we look at the chart of the S triple Qs, and this is an hourly chart, number one, we have a rebound in a change in the bearish momentum from a gap fill. And this gap fill happens to be 44.65. Now, mind you, this is a reverse index ETF, meaning the gaps below always get filled. In a regular chart, 99% of the gaps above are always filled. In this case, the gaps below are filled. So the bet here is we see a gap down, closing the gap at 47.36, and then it bounces higher again. And therefore, if it does play out to begin with, you close right away in the morning and you move on. And lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have existing home sales and we have more Fed zombies speaking this time around, Philly Fed President Harker along with Governor Waller. On the earnings calendar, we have one of my favorite names, SLB. Now, if it goes down, I'm going to be buying right away. This is a good name, excellent earnings, but it ran too high too fast. It could experience a pullback. If it does, I'll buy it, no questions asked at all. Now, folks, this is all I got for you for now. But a reminder, we have a video coming out tomorrow, earnings review. And then for the members, we have portfolio review and the weekly recap on Sunday. Once again, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching, and I will talk to you over the weekend. Take care. You can pass the amendment. I'll just filibuster the main bill. No, you won't. Watch me. 
As much as I'd like to see you hold your piss for two days, we struck a deal with Hector. <laughs>